This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Tonight's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8, and we're in verses 1 to 8 this evening. Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. This is God's word. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Amen. I'm going to invite Phil now to come up um, and we'll bring Joao and his family onto the screen um, and we'll jo- enjoy a little time of getting to know them a bit better. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Not sure which microphone to go for here. Uh, It's lovely to be with you all again. Thank you so much for another invitation and another really warm welcome. I've always enjoyed my times coming up here and sharing with the good folks in Bloomfield. And I'm uh, delighted that we were able to be joined with Joao and Anna Sid. There they are. There's Anna on the the screen as well. I think, Anna, you've got someone looking after... Uh, The baby tonight, little Joao, that's very good of you. So I guess if Anna needs to duck out, or if Joao needs to duck out, you'll know what's happening. Um, But thank you so much for making the effort to be here this evening to tell us a little bit more about yourselves and the ministry that you're involved in. So I've got a few questions for you, um, really to help you to introduce yourselves to everyone here. So tell us about yourselves your backgrounds, how you came to faith, and tell us a little bit more about your family. Joao, do you want to start us off? Sure. Hello. Thank you for having me in a way. Um, So our background, my personal background is that I was born in a a Christian home by God's grace. my father was converted when he was 17. Um, my, my mother uh, was actually herself born in a Christian home as well. Uh, it was my grandparents who, who, who were converted. Uh, both my father and my grandparents on my mother's side, they were converted from, a, uh, uh, from Roman Catholicism. And um, it is a particularly mystical um, um, branch, I would say, of Roman Catholicism here in, in Portugal. For example, on my father's side, you would have a bit of a mix of uh, uh, other oriental elements. Um, as for myself, um, I was um, raised um, in the church and, uh, and came to, to understand my, my sin and, and um, and ask for, for forgiveness and, and trust in Christ. And by God's grace, he has been um, keeping me and, and helping me grow um, as time passes. Great. 
Anna, do you want to tell us a little bit about your coming to faith yes. and your background? Yeah, I'm also, I also grew up in a Christian family. Uh, in my family, I was fourth generation believer. So my great grandparents were the ones from both sides who converted, also from Roman Catholicism, also from a very mixed mystical Roman Catholicism uh, in, the, in the village uh, that connects all these um, divination things and um, all these uh, elements. Um, and so I, I had the privilege of growing um, the father and mother who loved Jesus and raised me in faith. Um, so from early on, just um, I believed and um, it was um, a blessing to, to be raised as a Christian. And then later on, I got to go as well in that camp and <laughs> we got married there. <laughs> that was a very short version. Uh, where... Yeah, I, I'm the worst storyteller. He's well, a good one. Yeah. Joao, do you want to fill in any of the details, or, or <laughs> shall we leave that till you're here in person? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think it would be best for for the rest of the details for, for an in person uh, meeting. I don't know. Yeah, they, right. The rest is history. Uh, how, uh, is that how they say it? Yes, in a good way. Yes. <laughs> and um, Anna, you said that you are a fourth generation Christian. Now that may not mean very much to us here in Northern Ireland, but that really is quite remarkable in a Portuguese context. Yes. So I think my great grandparents were probably the first believers, what some of the first believers here in Portugal. So when they became Christians, uh, there was a, a small revival in Portugal, and that's when the gospel arrived uh, to Portugal. So most of the churches, <coughs> the old churches in Portugal, will have around hundred and some years. Uh, that's our old, <laughs> oldest church, uh, churches are um, around that time. So um, some missionaries from the UK uh, came um, to work uh, with church, with, with the church. Some others came as um, to work in factories or in mines. Uh, mines? Yeah. Um, and they, they shared the gospel around and there was a small revival uh, in that generation and that's how my great grandparents became mm. believers and it's amazing yes uh, it's um the beginning of the gospel here in portugal yes. yes remarkable coming from our background um we think back to 1859 revival and even before that we've got so much gospel heritage here um to praise god for and yet that's that's really not the case in the land of Portugal. Tell us a little bit about your your family. So there's not just the two of you. There is little João. Tell us a little bit about him. So he's uh, one and a half year, years old now. Um, in, in, yeah, in just two days, will be 18 months. Um, and yeah, he's walking, talk, talking a little bit. Um, and yeah, starting to understand uh, a few things. So, so it's yeah, it, it's it's a it, it's a it's a fun phase, mm -hmm. I, I guess. I'm having fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, tell us a little bit more about your location. Where exactly are you in Portugal? Um, paint a, a picture for us of the area. <laughs> Uh, so we are in central Portugal uh, and uh, a little bit more inland than, than near the, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we're in a town called Loza, uh, which is near, uh, the, the nearest city would be Coimbra, um, and, and it would be uh, one of the main cities in, in, in Portugal after Lisbon and Porto. Um, and has a, a very old university, so there's kind of, there's kind of a university culture 
um, around here, specific clothes for 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 students, and yeah, it, it, it's a uh, there's a lot going on. At, even myself, coming from 250 kilometers uh, south, I don't quite fully understand yet, but but I'm I'm trying to grasp it as as, as I go. Um, yeah, we, we have we're near a um, small mountain range here uh, in Lausanne. Um, it's windy, and for for Portugal standards, it's cold. For 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 my standards, it's cold, but I may not be fair to you. Um, so that's, um, and how, how yeah, many so, people are in the are in the town? What's the sort of population size of Loza? So our town has around the, really the actual town. It's maybe fourteen to fifteen thousand people, but it's a a the main town in, in the I think you would call it county or something like that. Uh, so the county would be seventeen something thousand. And when I was across, one of the things that amazed me uh, when we went to explore the town was the interest in rugby that the town has, <laughs> which is very bizarre because you don't associate um, Portugal with lots of rugby teams, but there is it, an interest. It's true. The, the field, the, the, the pitch is actually in, uh, in front of our, our church building. So, um, and, and, and it's... Uh, it's odd for me as well. I'm I'm a, a Lisbon guy. It's all about football. Nothing else matters really. <laughs> but, but here you would have rugby is very popular. Volleyball is very popular as well. There's big competition in the summer. Uh, I I myself I'm surprised. So, so um, it, yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, quite this, uh, what you would expect in a, a Portuguese, your average Portuguese Ronaldo obsessed town. <laughs> and then tell us, maybe Anna, could you tell us a little bit about the, the religious <coughs> beliefs of the town? Um, just kind of describe, you know, what the, the dominant religion is and how that shows itself in maybe everyday life for people. Yeah, so. Most people would um, present themselves as Catholic, uh, and then they would will add an, an adjective to that word. They will either say practicing Catholic or non-practicing Catholic, but either wise they are Catholic. That's how they, they introduce themselves. Um, and so Roman Catholicism is the main um, predominant religion here. Um, it, it's ingrained in everything uh, around the, the town. So uh, there are uh, parades um, that the, the president attends and he, he joins and the marching bands also go and the kids dress up as angels and go. So the whole town goes out to uh, participate uh, in these uh, festivities where they walk with a statue of um, a saint and um, <coughs> it's what unites the community so if you go to that uh, you are part of the community you are there there's thousands of people uh, and uh, it's just a very big part of society and it's it's very much like that throughout uh, Portugal, and not in the main cities, I wouldn't say Lisbon or Porto are like that, but in the villages and towns, uh, there's all of these traditions. So to be Portuguese is to be Roman Catholicism, is to um, uh, to kneel down before these um, statues. But then there's also uh, a lot of uh, mysticism uh, connected to that, where you you go and uh, uh, ask for a, fa a, a, fa a special favor to the saint, and then you have to pay it back. Uh, so you have to do some sort of sacrifice, um, um, either by walking or by giving money or by uh, kneeling down and going um, 
and going for many kilometers. So, yeah. at the same time, people also believe in uh, stars and um, all of the more pagan. Uh, you wouldn't associate that so much with Roman Catholicism, but it, they, they kind of go together here. So, stars and divination powers and asking things uh, to the angels if they can. There's sort of a white magic, they would say, mm -hmm. like the good kind of um, magic. So, I, I think those things go um, a lot around here. People don't have them figured out in their uh, minds, but they believe in mm -hmm. a mix of all these things. So, it's kind of a a superstitious Roman Catholicism, you might say, or certainly superstition yeah. is woven into, yes. into the, yes. the fabric yeah. of um, religion there. Uh, Shumayo, back to you. What would you say are the unique challenges to the advance of the gospel in Portugal? I know there will be a lot of challenges, but what are maybe one or two of the really big ones as you see it? Yeah, so... so... One of them would be connected to this is to, to be able to present uh, a our, our church and evangelical churches or, or Protestant churches as as a like credible. I don't know if you, have, if you do you get do you understand that okay. okay. Um, so it, 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 there's a lot of suspicion uh, around around something that's that's uh, not the main thing. Like to to as Anna said, to be Portuguese is to be Roman Catholic. If you're if you're not Roman Catholic, you're you're foreign or you're weird or or some some combination of of, of those things. So so to be able to uh, just have a a a level zero conversation is is Hard. You, you have to 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 put to the side a lot of of, uh, of misconceptions and preconceptions. Um, and and the, the other thing, it's also related to this, is that we don't have a heritage, as you as you put it, Phil. Uh, so we uh, some some evangelicalism in Portugal is about um, about trying to put meat and and muscles in a body without a skeleton something like that it, it's we we don't have some things we don't have in some areas we don't have much to build on uh, from from before um which which makes it so that some communities <laughs> will um inherit something from the first generation of believers but they don't really know how to to work around that, and then the second generation will uh, um, will yeah, will, will fall away, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So so that's happened in 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 in, um, in in a few places. It's happening a bit here in in central Portugal as well. There are uh, quite a number of churches that that are closing, um, and then churches that in the first generation when people for first converted were strong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, no, not not much of a a a background to to build build upon. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a real challenge. That's really helpful insight uh, into the needs. In one sense, Portugal's not very far away. I'm sure many of us maybe have travelled there on holiday, and yet spiritually, it's a different world, isn't it? Um, to our own little province. Now, you and Anna are involved in two very strategic significant ministries, um, church revitalization and student work. So tell us firstly about the church in Loza, um, just very briefly about its history. Anna, your connection to it, because that goes way back, um, when they called you as pastor, what your main roles are, that kind of thing. Um, well, uh, Anna will then tell you her connection. Mm -hmm. um, so the church here, it's a it's a small church. We we will have between twenty and twenty four people on 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 a Sunday, um, and 
in, in, in the, I think, I think, no, I know the church it has been here for almost, for over 60 years, so uh, even over 70, so it will be 75 in, 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 in a few years. Um, and, but it, it has never had a minister. Uh, it was never very big, uh, even though 70 years is, it's, it's something. Um, but it was never very big. Uh, and over the past 20, 20 years, it had, it went from being um, what you would call maybe average size for the area here in Portugal to, to come to, to shrinking down um, over the, the, the last 20 years. When I, so Anna, Anna was, um, this was the church she was, she was raised in. Uh, and when I when I, I visited uh, before we got married, I visited her parents. There were Sundays uh, in which there were maybe eight people, nine uh, nine people in in, in the pews. Um, yeah, so, so it's been shrinking down, and again, it's a snowball. So you shrink down in numbers, you shrink down in morale, uh, and and you, it yeah, it just kind of keeps rolling. Um, so. Over the years, by talking with Anna's parents, they, they are here in the church. Um, we, we understood that there was a real need here. Um, and Anna's parents, they have been working here in the church, even though they, they have full-time jobs. They, they do um, uh, a lot of things in the church, and they have in the past 20 years. Um, and with, between talking, um, well, while well, I was uh, knowing Anna, then after we got married, um, we understood that it was a there was a real need, um, and then, yeah, uh, we we took some some steps to uh, and, and along with the church um, for 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 them to 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 uh, to decide if they wanted to have a pastor for the first time in the church life. Um, and yeah, and that's how we progress, progress and, and, and yeah, here we are. Mm. And how long have you been um, minister of the church, Joao? Mm, uh, well, uh, around, yeah, less than a year, 10 months, maybe 10 months. And I know whenever I was across visiting you, it was really noticeable to me the benefit of you, Anna, having been brought up in the town and um, just walking around. It's obviously knew lots of people and had connections already there in the community. Yeah. That's a big yeah. advantage. Exactly. I, I went to school here, so I have friends from school. I, I know the, the, the teachers and the professors and it's, it, even though there's 17,000 people, it's, it has the small town feeling. So when you come back, you know, if you know people, you, they, they stay here, they, they got married here, they got jobs here, so they stayed. And um, yeah, there, I, even though my parents and my, great, my grandparents are not from here originally, they moved here when I was small, uh, when I was six, even though that happened, I still have some roots here, mm -hmm. so uh, I, I know um, a lot of people and that's, yeah, that's a, a good opportunity and a good door to, mm -hmm. to um, already start from somewhere and um, yeah, develop some conversation. And Joelle, what are, looking forward, you know, what are your hopes and dreams? for the work. Obviously the Lord is sovereign, but as you look forward um, to the providence of God, how would you like to see the church develop and grow? So right now uh, we're still uh, trying to, to find out and, and form, I think, our core um, and well, trying to, to encourage and, and uh, build up the people who have clearly manifested that they, they are committed and, and they are they, they want to, to be part of the church and, and to serve and also trying to 
maybe move some people from, from fringe to core uh, who maybe have not found their, what they, how they can serve uh, within, within the church. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the greatest challenge for, for, for the teachers to, is, is for, for the next uh, few years will be to build a strong, strong core that has really good, uh, um, really good bonds and strong bonds be between, uh, between them, well, between us and, um, and, and move, move from there. Uh, after that, I, I think we, we, that, that small town feeling has some advantages that I think, um, if we can penetrate uh, the, um, some of the, um, of the institutions in the town, uh, I think there, there's, there's really room for, for growth and, and for making the church known um, and, and, and sharing the gospel in some things that are as simple as, as, uh, as participate, participating as church in, in, in social work or, or something like that. It, I think the people are open, more open to, to, to that, and then they will be open to, to, to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. One example, I think, is I'm teaching evangelical Christian religion and morals in a public school uh, here. Um, I have now eight students this year, and it it's really good to be with kids. They are aged eight to uh, eight to eleven, eight to twelve. Uh, but it's also really good to just know the staff of the school and know the teachers and know the director of the school. He he's He's, is, he's known in, in the town. The, the, so being in a small town has some of those, mm. I think, uh, advantages. Mm. Let's switch focus now um, to Anna and your ministry uh, with GBU, or we would know as IFES, with, with students. Um, so how long have you been working with Christian unions in Portugal? And, and, and what does that role actually involve, Anna? So I, I have been working with um, GBU, with Student Ministry, for eight years now, um, and my my job is to, right now I, I'm responsible for four university cities around um, central Portugal, so it's almost a square around uh, Lausanne, Lausanne doesn't have a university, but the, the cities around, and my job is to uh, train students for university mission to share the gospel, to share the good news about Jesus, to encourage them, to give them the vision of IFIS and uh, what we do. Also, I, I do discipleship with some students, or some one on one on one to ones, um, and I then sh share some of the national responsibilities like organizing events and organizing camps and um, giving some training as well. Um, so that's what I do. Mm. Mm -hmm. My son Isaac just started um, study at Queen's and they had their first meeting uh, last week and it was around, they had around 500 people, 500 students for the first meeting. That's not the case in no. Portugal. <laughs> no. What yeah, is, for what, the whole country, yeah, no. <laughs> what, what's it like to be a Christian student in Portugal? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that the, the challenges are not very different from the challenges that students face in other university cities in Europe. So, secularism and um, relativism and postmodernism, so all of those ideas are are the same here. Um, also, the the fear of being cancelled, huh? um, and if you have more <coughs> conservative views, maybe now with all these polarized politics, you get associated with more extremist um, parties, and students are also afraid of that. So, those are big challenges for um, believers. Um, here, uh, but I, I think a different challenge from probably from Ireland uh, 
Northern Ireland would be um, that students are very lonely. So maybe if you leave your hometown, you go to a university city and you live there and you're the only believer. That's that's the case in for many students. They are there are either one or two believers in the in some universities. And if the other believer is not very encouraged, then you are alone um, and you don't have uh, someone to connect to. And some of these universities are also in cities that are in need of a, a good church. So they don't even have mm -hmm. uh, good churches that they can uh, connect to during their university years. So it can be very lonely for students, especially if you don't go to a big university like Lisbon or like Porto, if you go to some of the small, small ones that I work with, um, it can be very lonely. And also some of these students are from uh, Portuguese speaking countries, uh, maybe African or, or Brazilian uh, uh, countries. And, um, yeah, they are very far from their culture, from their uh, everything, and um, it, it can be very, very lonely for, for them as believers. Well, it certainly is a vital role that you have then in encouraging these isolated um, students. And we're going to hear much more about your both of your ministries when you come across. We're really looking forward to having you here in person. But um, just tell us as we finish off. How can we pray for you and your family and the ministries? You know, give us two or three prayer points that we can pray for tonight, but also take home and pray about. Yeah, as for our family, I think uh, one, yeah, one good prayer point would be that we moved not so long ago here, and Anna has Anna was away uh, for six years, uh, six seven years. I'm not from here. So have a lot of relations more south of Port southern Portugal. Um, that means we end up spending quite a bit of time on the road. Uh, if we have like a, a family event, we we go three hundred kilometers. We just just did it for a wedding, then three hundred kilometers back, uh, and sometimes in a very short. Um, span of time because we have to be back for, for Sunday. Uh, that puts some strains in, in, in our yeah for everyday life. So so if you pray for that, um, that we have uh, strength and, and, and we are fresh and, and, and available um, uh, here, not only for church but also for, for building up relations here. Um, for for the church again I think the biggest challenge right now is um, the building up of, of a good, strong uh, fellowship bonds between between the people um, in the church, and particularly those who are committed and and and, and want to, to to serve. Um, yeah, I think that's also a great point for the church. You want to uh, and for university students for the start of the academic year and for encouragement um, in student ministry and the student mission. Well, listen, thank you so much for making the time and effort to share with us this evening. I think it was really informative, quite moving, inspiring as well. And, you know, we're so thankful for your partnership in the gospel uh, with Joao and Anna and their little one, and really looking forward to bringing them across. They'll be here on Sunday morning, the 1st of December. So keep that one in your diary. And they will actually be here for a little bit before that. Um, we have our EMF Belfast conference on the Saturday, the day before they're here. And we'll be sharing a little bit more at that. Um, but we'll be telling you more about their visit in due course. So thank you so much for being here um we'll be praying for you in a moment or two but um yeah you take care and god bless and we'll see you soon well please take your bibles back to that portion we had read for us a little bit earlier by james acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 8 a really pivotal portion in the book of acts 
Bulgarian pastor Christo Kulichev knew what it was to suffer for Christ. Kulichev lived and ministered during the communist era there. Due to his outspoken faith and his passionate proclamation of the gospel, he became a marked man. On January 9th, 1985, he was arrested, tried and imprisoned for disobedience to the communist regime. His crime was that he continued to preach in his church. His trial, of course, was a mockery of justice. He was sentenced to eight months imprisonment, but during his incarceration, he made Christ known every way he could. And when he finally got out of prison, he wrote these words. And I quote, Both prisoners and jailers asked many questions, and it turned out that we had a more fruitful ministry there than we could have expected in church. Kulichev says God was better served by our presence in prison than if we had been free. And there are thousands of stories like this to tell today and even more over the centuries of Christian history. The lesson comes true again and again. God uses the sufferings of his people to accomplish his sovereign purposes. And that's exactly what's happening in our passage this evening. You see, up until this point, opposition to the early church had been quite limited. It was pretty low key. But on the day of Stephen's death, just a few verses back, a great persecution erupted with the ferocity of a violent storm. Saul, we're told, began ravaging the church, tearing it apart, going from house to house and dragging off men and women and throwing them in prison. As a result, Christians are being driven out of the city, forced to flee for their lives. But even in the midst of this disastrous <coughs> turn of events, God remains in complete control. That brings us to the first of our two points. Nothing can stand in the way of God's sovereign purposes. Nothing can stand in the way of God's sovereign purposes purposes. This flight of the Christians from Jerusalem is an extremely significant moment in redemptive history. It's a, it's a turning point in the whole story of salvation. You see, until now, the early church was centered in Jerusalem. No one had moved beyond the borders of the city. However, cast your minds back to Acts one verse eight, another pivotal portion. And you'll remember Jesus saying that his people were to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, this great commission is now beginning to be fulfilled as many in the church are forced to flee. Where did they go? Chapter eight, verse one, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And what were they doing as they went? Going about, verse 4, <coughs> preaching the word, bearing witness to Christ, proclaiming the good news. So the storm of persecution whipped up by the enemies of the church ended up fanning the flame of the gospel into new and unreached areas. Instead of smothering the gospel, they succeeded only in spreading it. What they meant for evil, God used for good. How wonderful is God's providence and his sovereignty? You and I, fellow believers, ought to take great heart from this in our day and age. The truth is that nothing and no one can thwart God's sovereign purposes, whether it's ruthless dictators or godless governments, false religions or evil ideologies. The more the world opposes the church, 
the more the Lord preserves and protects his gospel. The hidden hand of God is always at work. The hymn writer gets it right. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Take heart, fellow believer. Our God and his mission is unstoppable. Isn't that good news? Secondly, we learn that no one is beyond the reach of God's saving grace. No one is beyond the reach of God's saving grace. So the gospel is spreading as the believers are scattered. But verse 5, Luke turns our attention to one of those scattered believers, to Philip. We're told Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, that's one of those little details we could easily run past. And yet we ought to stop and take note because this was a significant step. History records that there was an intense animosity between the Jews and Samaritans. And that this hatred had existed for hundreds of years. In fact, in Jesus' day, good Jews wouldn't even set foot in Samaria, lest their feet would be polluted. That was the extent of the hostility. Those were the barriers. This then, Samaria, was surely the most unlikely place for gospel work and gospel growth. Yet we're told as Philip breaks new ground and he preaches the word and he proclaims Christ, a miraculous spiritual awakening takes place. Verse 6, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said and saw the signs that he did. The spiritually tormented, the physically broken were healed by the presence of the Spirit as Jesus was being proclaimed. And so verse 8, don't you like verse 8, there was much joy in that city. Once again in Acts, we are being told that the gospel transcends culture, class, and color, that it is for those of every race, every rank, and every religion. And therefore, we ought to remember that no one is beyond its reach, that no heart is too hard for the Lord. And yet, Isn't it easy to think deep down that there are certain people and they are just too far from Christ? They're too stained with sin. They're too settled in their own belief. Maybe it's a wayward son or daughter or an indifferent next door neighbor or an antagonistic colleague at work and deep down we've begun to believe They'll never come to Christ. But when we think like this, we have failed to properly understand the explosive power of God's word. The glory of the gospel is that it is able to radically transform even the most unlikely of individuals. Even someone like Saul. The passionate persecutor of God's people was no match for God's grace. With the Lord, nothing is impossible. He is able to save and to save to the uttermost. No one is beyond the reach. God's saving grace. Well, may these Two vital truths fuel our prayers for the lost. Fill us with fresh boldness this week as we seek to proclaim Christ to a lost and needy world. Amen.
Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org. Thank you.